morning. Good morning. Good morning. This week we are going to be talking about uh, the second part of um, the 11th chapter of, uh, of Destined to be Decisive. You know, and some of you are going, well, I've never seen that book. Well, it's not out there. It's still in David's notes and stuff. So we're working on it. But today, when we're, the part we're going to talk about is um, we are going to talk about baptism. And, you know, if you go out there in the world today, we're seeing a lot of, of people out there say, oh, the only way to get into Christ is through prayer. There's nowhere in the Word of God that actually confirms that. Well, we can just sprinkle people. No, there's no way it, it talks about. Can't even just do pouring. You know, and so we're going to go in and we're going to look at some of those scriptures. And we're going to understand why it is that we do this. It's not just because um, we do it for the fact that we make a statement. But it's, as this scripture here tells us, it's uh, that we an appeal to God for a good conscience. So as we start off, we the story, and most of you know this sto the story in Acts uh, 8, is about it, the Ethiopian eunuch who's traveling and he is leaving the Holy Land and he's headed back home and he's on his chariot and he's sitting in his chariot. Now we have to understand this guy is the treasurer of Ethiopia. So he doesn't probably have just a one seat chariot. He's probably got one of the Cadillac versions. You know, and he's sitting in his chariot and he's reading the book of Isaiah. And so God takes Philip and says, go to and tell this man. Go talk to him. And so when he gets there, it says, then Philip, Philip opened his mouth and began from the beginning of Scripture, he preached from that Scripture, he preached to him, and they went along the road and came to some water. And the Ethiopian eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? So it's really interesting here that it's, he started from Isaiah, and he was talking about the Messiah, and they're riding down the road, and the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch goes, look, there's water out there. I guarantee you, if he was in that Cadillac version he had, he had had enough water in there to drink that he could have used without having. And he says, "Then did you catch that?" It says, "He says if you believe with all your heart, you may." And he answered, and he says, "I believe that Jesus is the Son of God." And they both went down into the water. If you're going to sprinkle somebody, you don't need to go down into the water. If you're going to pour water on somebody, you don't need to go down into the water. But here they went down into the water, both of them. And it says that he immersed him. That's what the word baptism really means. It's baptizo is a transliteration. And it actually means to be fully immersed. They used to talking about ships that sunk. They were baptizo. They were sunk. And so that's what we're talking about here. And it says when they came up out of the water, the Lord uh, snatched Philip away and the unit no longer saw him but went on his way rejoicing. See, you know, we actually take and make that choice and make that statement that we believe that Jesus Christ, there's only one way that the Word of God, and that's what we're going to talk about. There's only one way that this Word of God talks about what we just participated in here, and that's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That was what it was talking about in the upper room. As, as Jesus tried to explain to them, you know, this is my body. This is my blood. He knew that he was going to the cross. You know, we, uh, Richard read the scripture about him being in the garden and said, Father, if you can take this cup away from me, take it away from me. But not my will, but your will. And if that's what you need me to do as your only son, then I'm going to do it because I know that that's what I came for. And so, you know, when we start getting into that, we start participating with him in this, it's all about that good consciousness. It's all about changing attitudes. And it's all about choice. And that's what we've been talking about for the last five or six months. Choices that we can make that make us right with God. And this world out there keeps saying, oh, there's other ways that we can get to that. And the Word of God is so explicit. Here when we go into Mark 16. And he comes in and he says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creations. He who believes and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has, has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will, uh, will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons, and they will speak with new tongues, and they will pick up serpents, 
If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will uh, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus had spoken to them. He had received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of, of God. You know, it's interesting if you actually go into most of your Bibles in this one here, it says that as he came into and he was with his disciples, that he said that he was having to rebuke some of them because they didn't, uh, they didn't believe even when they saw him back in real life. And see, that's what we see so often as we see that's out there. And so Jesus made it very plain to them. He said, if you believe and if you are immersed, he says, then you can receive the power of God. But if you disbelieve, and you don't. You know, and, and the insinuation there, the logic is if you disbelieve and you're not baptized, then you can't be saved. And see, there are a lot of people out there, all they didn't say if you're not baptized. It's, it's intended from the way the scripture was written. But if you don't believe, why would you go be baptized anyway? So it's, if you believe and are baptized, it means that you're making an appeal to God for a clean conscience and that you're going to change the things that you're doing in your life so that you can be what God wants you to be. All right. In Acts 2, 37 through 9, most all of us know this one. This is right at the very end of the 3,000 as, as Peter's dealing with them and giving that first sermon on the Pentecost. And it says, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and each one of you be baptized into the name of the, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy spirit for the promises for you and your children and all who are far off as many as the Lord, our God will call to himself. Did you catch that? He said, look, it's for you today. I want you to repent and go and be immersed. Well, their response was, is, look, you've cut us to the quick. You've convinced us that it's Jesus Christ is the one that went to the cross and he died for our sins. He bled for me. And he said, what do I have to do now? And he said, repent. That means turn and go a different direction. And he says, be immersed. Why? Because being immersed is participating in the death, the burial, and the resurrection so we can become new creations. We can become these new creatures that God is calling to himself. And he says that if we're willing to do that, not only for those people of that day, he says not only for their children, but he says for all of them, all people far off. That's us. He says that if baptism is the way into Christ. And it's so important, and we see so many places out there, oh, baptism isn't important. I don't need to do that. All I have to do is confess Jesus, and I'm good. That's not what, that's not what God said. That's not what Jesus said. Now we hear it from Peter. That's not what Peter said. We heard it when, from Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. And the, uh, they're just going down the road, and, and he's telling them about Christ. And, all, and he had to have mentioned being immersed into Christ. He said, look, there's water. So when you logically look at how important this, is, uh, this has to be, you have to understand that it's an important part of it. In Matthew 28, 16 through 20, this is one that I have a tendency to quote. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, Jesus never said that it was that important. Well, we already saw once that he did. Now in 16 here, he comes in and he says, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. See, in two different places, Jesus mentions, and this is as he's getting ready to leave this earth, He's even talking to unbelievers that have seen him resurrected. They had the opportunity to put their hand in his side, to check the, the holes in his, in his wrists and his, his, his uh, hands. And yet there were still some there that didn't believe that he was inside. And he says, this is what you have to do to change that attitude. And you have to make the choice to do that. 
And did you catch that? He says, not only do you have to be into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, there, it's really interesting, and I've, I've shared this once before with you, but it's so important. There's a little three-word phrase there. It's estuanoma. And estuanoma means into. If you go back and you look at references in, in um, the Greek and into historical teachings, that into meant that you were changing your name into somebody else's name. You were into the name of, the, of Caesar, into the name of whoever was buying your property. That is S2 and Ome. So if you look there, every place there, he comes in and he says that we were baptized S2 and Ome into the Father, S2 and Ome into the Son, and S2 and Ome into the Holy Spirit. We became possessions that changed our name. We made a choice to change our name from what it was, which was of the world, to becoming of God. And that's what baptism does for us. That's where it puts us. If you go down to Acts 22, 14 through 16, he says, and he said, The God of our Father has appointed you to know His will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from His mouth, for you will be a witness for Him to all men and what... Um, you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name, on his name. This is when Ananias comes to Peter. And Peter's been blinded. He's been led by the hand into Damascus. He stayed there for three days because his eyes were had to where he couldn't see. We're still trying to figure out exactly what they were. There was some kind of film or something. And finally, God sends Ananias to him and gets to Paul and says, Paul, you know what you need to do. Why are you still sitting here? God has called you and he personally called you. Get up and go get yourself immersed so that you're properly in the kingdom. You know, it just baffles me when I see these, especially the, you know, there in Matthew, when Jesus comes, he says, all authority has been given to me. Anybody that's ever been in the military, you know what it means when a commanding officer comes to you and he asks you to do something. You know, it, it was really interesting because I learned that as I was in ROTC, you know, my freshman, freshman and, uh, and junior year. And the one thing that you, were, you learned that you could do is you can answer three ways. Yes, sir. No, sir. And I don't know, sir. And you better not use the third one. Because if you don't know, you're in trouble. Because he's going to help you find out what it is. But that's what authority of Jesus was. We have a responsibility. When he says, all authority is mine, then when he gives us a command, we have an obligation. And the only reason we have an obligation is because we have chosen to say, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And I want to be in his possession and be one with him. And that makes it to it's a choice that we have to choose. This world has gotten to a point where they don't want to choose God. They want to choose self. Look at all the stuff that's going on right now. And you, there's no way that you can say that this is of God. It's about self. It's about me. It's about I. It's about myself. And until we can get rid of those things, this world is still going to have problems. And it's still going to go through a lot of changes. And it's only until somebody starts to get the idea that without Christ, they can't change. Because we're, as Solomon in our lesson today, talks about being under the sun in that horizontal relationship, that horizontal life that gives us maybe 70, 90 years on the outside. He says, then it's gone. But we've got to make sure that we're right. And we, that the only way that we can be right is by following what Christ has told us. To move into... Uh, into Romans. Paul here writes, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Or, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with 
so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. Have you put that old self to death? Have you chosen to make that choice? Because that's what it's about. We can no longer act like we thought. We can no longer live like we used to think when we were young and foolish. He said, you know, there are so many people out there that are continuing to find, try and find happiness outside of God. And Solomon kept saying, as we read in our lesson this morning, it's all vanity. It's like chasing after the wind. But if we make this decision, did you catch that? He says, he says, for all who have been immersed into Christ have been immersed into his death. He's made us new. We're new. And we get to change the way we think, the attitudes we have, the integrity we have the compassion that we have, because now they are to be replicated or replications of what Christ did when he walked on this earth. He moved down into Galatians. As Paul is writing to Galatians, he says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ. For all who have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ. See, that baptism sets us aside. It sets us apart. It sanctifies us. It justifies us. It says you become a unit. You become committed to Christ and committed to each other because you are the family of God and you become one. See, we shouldn't be thinking as individuals. This is about God's church. And he already tells us, all authority has been given to me and I'm going to tell you how to do this and I've left 12 of my closest friends to be able to instruct you. And then on, that, on top of that, he went out, for those of us that are Gentiles, and he said, Paul... I need you to get away from what you're doing and quit kicking against me and come and follow me because I need you to go convince this Gentile world that I, who I am and what I am and to bring them to follow me. In Ephesians, you know, this is one that, uh, you know, is pretty simple when you get down to it. You know, and it's one that most of us, this is another one, if you don't have it on your refrigerator or have it someplace special, you might have it there. Therefore, our, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, there is one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. See, you know, when we start hearing from people out there, and it's all over the Internet, oh, you know, I was baptized one time, you know, I was immersed, but, you know, now I've got to go through a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's not what it says. It says there's one baptism, and that's what occurs when we are, go through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit. That's what Peter tells us in, two, in Acts 2. He says, once you have been buried in with Christ and you come out, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's where it comes. We don't have to go in there and go through this, this sacrament that people say, oh, you know, you just got to stay here and pray. And when I was in college, I had a chance to go to a, uh, to a um, Christian revival group one, time, one night. I got invited from a guy in the dorm, so I said, yeah, I may as well go find out what's going on. Well, I had a guy that decided that he needed to be baptized in the Spirit. It took us three hours before we could leave there because he had to labor in the Spirit until he, he felt the Spirit come on him. That is not what the Word of God talks about. He said, Jesus says, my yoke and my teaching is easy. 
I'm not going to put all these burdens on you. I'm not going to put 318 or 618 commandments that you have to follow to get here. Paul continued to argue with the Judaizing teachers saying, well, you've got to be circumcised first. And said, no. That's not what God taught. He said, if you want to be mine, you have to believe and you have to be baptized. Pretty easy. And he says, there's three commandments you've got to follow. That you love the Lord your God, that you love your neighbors yourself, and that you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And he says, all the laws and prophets are tied up in those three. God made it easy. But sometimes we make it so difficult because we continue to, we forget the love that God has for us and what he paid when he did this. Let's move down to Colossians. He says, I thank God that I was, I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any others. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so the cross of Christ would be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, and it's actually out of Isaiah, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever. I will set aside. See here, Paul, Paul definitely believed in baptism. We know that he baptized, but what was happening is he and, and, uh, and Apollos, you know, were getting and they were teaching and they were having people come. And what was setting up is people were setting up in different camps. Well, I'm a Paul. Well, no, I'm a Paulus. And Paul said, no, you're not. You're not of me. I haven't even hardly baptized any of you. I know Apollos has, but I haven't. And besides, you're not of Apollos either. We are all of Christ. Going back to that other script, we are united as one. And he says, it's not about Paul. It's not about Apollos. We can go down and look at all these, uh, these religions that claim to be following Christ, and we can say, it's not about the Catholics. It's not about the Methodists. It's not even about the Church of Christ. We are Christ Church. Universal. And we have an obligation that he said if you want to believe, you have to be baptized and you have to be changed and become one in my church. You know, as we have looked at this, you know, there are other scriptures that we can talk to and so many others that make reference to baptism and what it really means. But, you know, when we go back to that very first scripture, you know, he's, it says that baptism is not for the removal of dirt from this body. It's not to come up in front of a group of people and say, oh, look at me. It's about a clean conscience before. And it's about becoming a new creation. One that is chosen to repent. That is chosen to be immersed into the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And has chosen to change their life, their attitudes, their being, to be Christ-like. That's what we claim. We claim to be Christian. Are we living to be Christ-like? See, that's the whole purpose of this first step. He said, now we're in the possession of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They own us. Because they bought us out with the death of Christ on the cross of this world of sin. And we're no longer there. We keep finding people that want to go back. That's why Hebrews was written to the Hebrew people. Because the persecutions became so dumb bad that they said, it would just be easy to go back to, uh, to Judaism. And the writer, you know, a lot, there's still some discussion as to who wrote it, but I can't believe that it was too far from the pen of, of Paul. And he said, are you mad? That's what he told the Galatians, are you crazy? You're going to go away from what you already have? 
He said, because this is where the gospel comes, the good news. That we have a place in heaven set aside for us. Without this, we can't have that. Without belief, we can't have, we, but we've got to have both. They were connected together, belief and action. So when you start looking at your life, are you truly the new creation? That's all, all we want to be. We want to be Christ-like. We want to be united in that commitment. And we want to tell this world out there, all this self stuff, all this stuff about I and me and mine, doesn't mean anything because, as, as Solomon said this morning in, in the lesson, he said there's going to become a time that the wise man and the fool are going to come to the same end. And he says nothing is going to matter from that point. It's what you've done to prepare that whole mission God has given us to be with him for eternity. If there's a way we can meet your needs this morning, if there's somebody that needs to come and really think about what we've done here to renew life, to renew your commitments, those that have not put Christ in baptism, if there's somebody that needs that, you know, come as we stand and say.